You're listening to the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast, a show all about inspiring you, the pharmacy professional, on your path towards achieving financial freedom. Hi, I'm Tim Baker, back with the case studies, this time with the Andersons. I sit down with YFP Planning's lead planners, Kelly Reddy Hefner and Robert Lopez, to walk through this fictitious family and their financial plan. Although the Andersons are not an actual couple we work with, they're really a composite of clients that we do work with in reality. The first part of the discussion, we lay the groundwork of the Andersons' jobs and salary situations, where they live. We walk through their net worth and point out important elements of their financial situation. And we also talk about their goals and what they're trying to achieve. We then talk back and forth about their financial situation. Um, one of the big focuses being education versus retirement planning and how to best use uh, their investments going forward. This is a bit of the behind the scenes look at what goes on at YFP Planning. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to YFP play, planning case study number two. So last time, if you remember, our first case study, which I thought you know was was a really uh, smooth uh, look at the the Joneses. This time, we're looking at YFP play, planning case study number two, the Andersons. So the Andersons that are a little bit different stage of life, but I'm excited to jump in with my colleagues Robert Lopez, Kelly Reddy Hefner. Guys, what's going on? Uh, how are things going? Where you're at? Good. Yeah. So it's 105 today. So 105 in Phoenix. Kelly, you are um, I'm sure all in on this case study. Um, not not imagining sitting on the beach next week. That's right. I uh am totally all in, not distracted at all, but excited to talk through, talk through people in mid-stage. Awesome. Awesome. All all good. So Robert, um, same as last time, why don't you set up and for, for those listening on the podcast, we are releasing these on video. So you should be able to see um, us kind of talk through our one page kind of overview of the Anderson. So Robert's going to set us up um, in terms of uh, salaries and things like that. Kelly's going to get into goals and debt, and then I'll kind of take us home and then we'll open it up for discussion and, and go from there. So Robert, Robert, why don't you take us away? Yeah, so today we're working with Fiona and Roy Anderson. Um, Fiona is a field medical director. She's 46 years old, making $155,000 a year. Roy is a pharmacy manager, 48 years old, making one thirty-five. dollars They're married finally jointly. They have two sons, Michael and Paul, who are aged 16 and 14, respectively. Uh, they live in Jersey City, New Jersey. Their gross income works out to about $290,000 a year which breaks down to around $24,000 monthly. And then their net or what they actually receive in their bank accounts is about $12,000 a month. Their expenses break down to fixed expenses of $6,300, variable expenses of $2,200, and then about $3,300 of monthly savings. They live and own a three-bedroom single-family house they purchased in 2008, which they got for $420,000 using a conventional 20% down. They had a 6% interest rate. And then in 2015, they were able to refinance to a 4% 30-year fixed mortgage. And then they have a few goals that they want to accomplish while we're working together hypothetically. So they want to pay for the four years of undergrad for Michael and Paul. Um, they are making 529 contributions, which they recently increased. They have a pretty robust amount in the account baseline. Um, they want to know if they'll have enough to accomplish that. Concurrently, they want to try to retire in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, one thing to consider is with the home that they currently own, they want to downsize and move to Florida. And then they are concerned about some of the debt that they still have uh, as well. So that debt's listed out as a home equity line of credit that has a 5% interest rate. Um, they remove they remodeled their kitchen and are paying $1,000 a month on that. They still have uh, car loans. They pay a total of $750 um, interest rates between 3.5 and 4.25 on the two car notes. They still have their own student loans, which is always an interesting intersection with paying your own um, children's college tuition as well. So they refinance to a 10-year um, private loan 4.25% five years ago. And then of course they have the mortgage. So it was a 30 year fixed 4% interest rate after that refi. They're seven years in and they're paying 2,500 a month. So then from the, the wealth building side, you know they have some cash in the bank, uh, 20 grand in check-in, 50 grand in savings. But in terms of their investments, they're looking at 
Um, so 401k, so they both currently have 401ks that they're contributing um, 4% each plus a 4% uh, employer match. So basically 8% in total. Um, they're both invested in the 2035 target date funds. They have, uh, Fiona has an old 401k, a small one that's 15,000 that she hasn't really looked at. They do have a 529 account um, that they're, they can increase their contributions lately to $1,000. So $500 for each son. Um, so $12,000 a year to kind of get to that goal. Um, unfortunately, they don't get a, an income tax deduction because in New Jersey, if you make more than $200,000, it's off the table. They do have a taxable account, which is basically Fiona's RSUs. So restricted stock units as part of her compensation, which we see in a lot of industry uh, pharmacists um, will we'll get that as part of their comp. So she has $125,000 um, that, that is currently sitting in there all in the company stock. And then they have a joint savings account um, that they're putting 100 bucks a month into... Um, that's considered kind of the rainy day, Michael graduation trip when he graduates high school, and then a traditional IRA that they're funding for Fiona um, that's in a, in a balanced fund. So that is basically their uh, investment accounts. Uh, uh, Roy also has a Roth IRA that has about 36000 in it that he's not contributing to. It's kind of just sitting there uh, presently. From a wealth protection, so this is typically where we talk about um, insurance and estate they have they each have a, a 20 term 20 year term 1 million dollar policy that they purchased 5 years ago plus a little bit of um group insurance uh, group life insurance um that basically matches their salary so 150,000 120 135,000 respectively um they both have short term and long term disability which which has a benefit of 60% um that's own occupation for 2 years and then any oc after that roy carries his own um professional liability policy. And then they have a will that was done when Michael was born. So basically 15, 16 years ago, no um, living trust or, or living will or trust power of attorneys that, that need to be updated. From a tax perspective, they currently use an accountant, um, but they're not sure if they're maximizing their deductions. Um, you know, They kind of recognize that New Jersey state income tax and property taxes are killing them, which is why a lot of people from New Jersey moved to Florida. It's not as bad. They typically owe taxes every year. So they're basically reaching in their pocket for that. And one of the big tax concerns they have is that Fiona, with Fiona's RSUs, they're worried about the capital gains on that and you know, not really sure what they, to use that for. So some other things are conflicted about how much to put towards college versus their own retirement. Can they retire in 15 years? And and you know, in retirement, they're really looking to, to up their travel game a little bit more. So I guess I'll pose the question um, to the group here. Uh, when you guys when you guys look at the Andersons, Fiona Roy, what are some major things that kind of stick out to to you um, when you're approaching them in terms of their financial plan? Robert, I'm going to you first. Yeah, so their first two goals that they have are kind of conflicting here. So they're they want to pay for education for the boys, but they also want to kind of make sure they're setting themselves up for retirement. One of the phrases that you'll hear a lot through financial conversations is, you know, you can take out loans for school, but you can't take out loans for your own retirement. So make sure you take care of yourself first. I think they've done a really good job with that so far. Um, they've saved a lot in their 401ks. They've set aside money for the boys at the same time. But now it's really deciding on how to be important about that or how to be decisive. Um, the 4% that they're doing into their retirement accounts plus 4% of a match is good, but not where we'd like to be. You know, I, ideally we want to be at at least 10%. Um, and I think there are going to be some ways that we can get them to that point. Um, I think that their savings in their their five two nine right now is aggressive at a thousand dollars a month. That's a pretty big chunk of their cash flow. Um, I think that that's actually going to be enough, depending on some scenarios we may discuss. But really deciding is the order that they gave it to us the correct order that they have? Is the boys' education more important than their own retirement? And are they willing to accept the opportunity cost or the the, the change that would require? they may need to work longer to send the boys to college um, and really kind of flushing that out. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the things that is interesting about this, this case, because we hear it for a lot of um, new practitioners is the, the age old question of, should I pay down my debt, i.e. my student loans, or should I get going on my retirement, my investments? And there's that push and pull that I don't think really ever goes away because there's just different things that are always competing against, you know, kind of that long term, you know, investment uh, game. So when you look at this, like what, how would you walk them through or walk them down the path of 
kind of getting down to the granular bits and pieces of the retirement versus like the education. Is that something that you would look to model out? Is it really kind of asking more um, uh, clarifying questions with regard to their goals? Walk me through your thought process there. Sure. And I mean, I agree with Robert that those are conflicting. So kind of talking through what's important when individuals have their own student loan debt, they really do tend to lean towards, you know, creating scenarios where that doesn't exist for their own children. So we do a high level nest egg that like popping some numbers in based on this case study, you know, they probably wouldn't be able to retire in 10 years based on these numbers. So Robert is correct about that too. Like more, more contribution would be better. As far as the education, we can model out and take a look. Um, you know, certain schools are going to be more cost effective. There are other things that students can do, good grades. Robert gives a great talk on CLEP exams, which I love. My own children have listened um, to some of the conversation. So there are ways to make college funding more affordable and to have those conversations. The kids are at an age at, especially at 16, really to start the conversation about what's affordable, what makes the most sense, um, and kind of the parents, you know, setting some boundaries on what they're comfortable with to not sacrifice their own retirement goals. So yeah, a combination of modeling would definitely answer some of the questions about that expected cost in the future, how much they're going to be able to cover, what the shortfall is. Um, And then I think Robert's right too about finding a better balance with the goals and how to prioritize them. Robert, can you give us the cliff notes on the CLEP thing? Because I think that's actually like pretty powerful. And if if you're a pharmacist that's, that's listening and they have that, you have kids that are Kind of high school age looking at colleges. This is something that I think flies on the even for me was pretty high. Paying. Yeah, Tim. So one of the the big things that we like to talk about with with clients is not necessarily just saving for college, but also ways to save on college um, and, and education expenses. So there are a ton of ways to do that. Whether it's you know planning to go to a um, a community college for the first couple of years, or it's maybe just ignoring traditional education and going toward trade schools. But one of the ways I like to do is just getting credits out of the way. And everyone understands uh, dual enrollment credits and everyone talks about you know AP courses where they can test out of college classes. But a CLEP, a C-L-E-P is run by the college board. Um, it's the same people that create the SAT. And what it is, is it's a test where you can sit down, take a one time test where it costs about 90 bucks on a bunch of general education classes. And if they pass that course, then they get to skip it in college. They get automatic credit that'll be accepted at the majority of universities. Now, every university and college has their own rubrics that they request. And they say, hey, you have to get at least a 65 on this class for it to count. And we only accept these five classes, but there's about 65 different CLEPs that different colleges will accept. So if you're a math major and you don't want to take English classes, take these two tests while you're in high school when you just learned English and never have to take it in college. Or if you're an English major who doesn't want to take mathematics, when you take a mathematics in high school, that's practicing for the test. You take a CLEP, you pass it, you never have to take it in college again. Um, It's a great way to either get a head start on college or get through the classes that are going to slow you down and allow you to get to the coursework that actually excites you and makes you want to go to college rather than slogging through the first two years of gen ed before you can get to the stuff that you care about. Yeah, I think it's, 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 you know, really important to highlight like all the tools that are available for students and parents to kind of make a good decision. And and I feel like, I don't know if, if I get in the time machine and go back to like when I was looking at schools, like I didn't have any, and I, and I think because, you know, I would have done very foolish things back in the day. And I think that um, if there are things that we can do, whether it's scholarships or things like testing out, um, it's going to put the, the the price tag a little bit more affordable. But I think Probably one of the things that I would want to model out and and what's interesting about the Andersons is that they have a goal in place. Um, a lot of people, especially if they ha- I think if they have young kids, will ask, like, what are what's the goal for like sending your kids to college? And it's like, I don't know. And that's where we kind of talk about the one-third rule, which we've talked about it at length, where you know, you can pay basically um the idea is that you know what you're putting into a, a 529. Um, is one source of the tuition. 
Um, and then another source would be basically when your child is 17 or 18 going into, you know, going into college, you're basically paying that out of your paychecks. Like you're, you're sending a check to the college. And then the last third would be the, um, scholarships and the student loans last but not least. So that we kind of use that as like a default. If there's no, you know, if there's no idea what they want to do with Fiona and Roy, they obviously have, you know, the, the idea to send them through four years of undergrad. So Kelly, we know that not all schools are created equal, right? So whether they go to somewhere like Rutgers, which is in-state in New Jersey, or somewhere like the University of Miami, which is a private school out of state in Florida, how how do you advise parents to kind of talk to their kids or just approach this with their kids in terms of sensible decisions with regard? And I know it's hard at, you know, a 17, 18 year old, how would you go about um, approaching that, that question? Well, definitely when we started that conversation, it was talking about like what our budget was, what we're going to be able to contribute. And then looking like when we would look up schools, understanding like what the tuition is, there's a number that pops up a lot on like schools websites. That's like an average cost. Unfortunately, depending on your income and for many of our clients, that income is not going to reflect what that average cost is. So the average cost assumes like 100% paid for in some scenarios, all the way up to paying the full price tag. So it's really good to understand what your cost is likely to be. And at this income level for Fiona and Roy, it's probably not a whole lot of financial aid. I would assume no financial aid based on need. So I do recommend having an understanding of what your cost might be, what schools are going to give those scholarships. Like there are certain schools that only give financial based need aid. Um, There are schools that give grants for being a tuba player, the football player, great academics. So like kind of knowing your skills, what your talents are and kind of a range. Like I would agree, like we mentioned Rutgers, like a state school is going to be different than Princeton, you know, what does that look like between the two? But I think people also discount like private schools and just seeing like, you know, some of those schools have pretty nice endowments and yeah. might give a better package. So I would say I'd look at a nice handful. You know, we sometimes see kids are applying to like 30 schools, you're busting your budget just on application fees. So pick a few that make sense, have like a few you can compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges, and be like, you're really looking for the best package and the best fit that's financially viable for for you and the student borrower who's going to take on any debt that you all can't pay for if the savings is at capacity. Yeah, I agree. I, I think I think one of the 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 wild cards in this whole situation is you know we look at the taxable account so. So I don't think I broke down like what they have in their 401ks, but you know Fiona has a uh, 425 plus another 15 in an old 401k. Roy has 459, and then they have 36.5 in a Roth IRA and 19.5 in a traditional IRA. I think the wild card Robert in in this whole scenario in terms of the planning is what to do with the RSUs, and these are kind of like a weird because it's compensation that comes in the form of stock that can grow over time. I'm a big proponent of like, okay, let's tie this to something. So is this, you know, is this something that is for retirement? Uh, is this something that they could apply towards the debt, towards the education? Um, what's your thought with regard to issues and how would you go about approaching how to kind of, you know, utilize that for the goals that the Andersons have? Yeah. So restricted stock units, for those who aren't aware, are uh, a form of compensation where the government gives you, or the the company gives you stock, uh, but you have to vest into it, right? So generally it comes in with a grant where it says, hey, you're going to get this many shares, and then you'll get uh, a portion of it every year or quarter or month, uh, depending on the the policy. So it's really like golden handcuffs. It's a way for a company to make sure that you're not going to want to leave. Hey, here's this money, but you have to stay here to get it. So yeah, you may want to leave, but you have you know, some unvested RSU grants that you're not going to be able to get if you leave right now. So you should probably just stay with us. One of the things that I like to make sure clients understand is that these RSUs are just income. 
right? It's it, it's taxed as income when you when you get it, and you need to treat it as such. So although it looks like this big shiny object that we have to save and grow forever, it is just income, and we can use it as such. So when we look at them, their big goals are, you know, hey, I want to pay for college. Hey, I want to make sure we retire. Hey, I want to have less debt. Um, and we want to, you know, help them again, rack and stack those goals where sure, if we need that money for college, then it's there. Right. But if we can find out a plan for college, okay, cool. Let's check that off. The boys understand what we have for them. The boys are going to come up with their own plan and it's going to be financially sound. Okay. Retirement. You have, how can we use this money towards retirement? We could reorganize our cash flow where we're actually cashing out some of these RSUs, which would allow us to put more away in our retirement buckets. That's a great way to use it. Um, another way is to to, to solve that fourth goal. Um, these RSUs, again, it's just a taxable investment account. We, we have an unknown um, what the capital gains are, so we're not sure in this scenario exactly how much of that is the grant itself and how much of that is gain. So there, there will be some tax um, complications of this plan, but that $125,000 could in reality pay off all of their debt other than the mortgage, right? So we could pay off the HELOC, which is $43,000 at 5%. We could pay off the cars at 3.5 and 4.25%. We could pay off the student loans at 4.25%. And then all they would have left is the mortgage. That would free up $2,300 in cash flow on a monthly basis. Just huge. That they could, that's huge. That's a yeah. huge amount of money. Okay. And that could then turn around and immediately go towards extra savings, extra travel budget for that graduation trip they want to take in two years. Um, extra 401k contributions. Right now they're doing 4% plus a 4% match. We could easily get that to 10 or 12% without changing their life at all, only by reallocating those RSU dollars that are just sitting in a holding to this thing. Um, we also know that she's getting more RSUs. So this isn't the end of her get, getting company stock. She's going to get those refreshed, which is what happens when you get a new grant all the time. So as long as she's still working, those grants are going to keep coming. And we just want to make sure we're using them appropriately. So if they're just sitting there, maybe they're growing, they're doing phenomenally. Maybe they're going down. Um, we got to check the company uh, trajectory. Um, but using that to, to solve an immediate goal, like get out of debt and save for retirement would be a huge lift on somebody's spirit. And having done that with clients in the past, taking those dollars that you feel like are being wasted and putting them to something that you actually feel pain over is huge. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I want to unpack, I, I, I love all of like the different avenues to go, you know, with that potential, you know, pot of money, the RSUs, which is like you said, another form of compensation. I think the other thing that I would, would really want to unpack for, with the two of them is just you know, retire in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, is it closer to 10? Is it closer to 15? You know, one of the, the, the stats going through my RICP coursework um, that I just thought was astounding was, you know, delay in retirement by three to six months is the equivalent of saving 1% more for the course of your 30 year career. Or another way to look at it is delay in retirement by one month is the equivalent of saving 1% more for the final 10 years before retirement. So one of the, one of the big things that, um, I think people get wrong in, in retirement is like when to claim social security, obviously, if you can delay that you have a, um, an income stream for life that is um, that follows inflation. That's that's super valuable. So, are there ways to, you know, uh, potentially increase that retirement paycheck? Now, they could look at us, and we know that this is true, guys. In in the, in pharmacies, like you know, I, I only got ten more years left. Like I'm I'm kind of I'm burning out. I'm not good. You know, maybe there's a, there's the ability to work part time or things like that. But I think. To Robert, to your point, being able to model out and move those pieces around to say, like, we could use this pot of money and clear all the debt that frees up that cash is a beautiful thing. But they could also say, like, we feel kind of bullish on the company that we want to let it ride. And maybe we'll, you know, go from we, we won't have the certainty there of like cashing out and retiring those debts. Maybe we'll let it ride for greater upside, but we know that there's risk there um, as well. So, it's super fascinating. The nice thing about this is there are pieces to move here and there's there's different scenarios to run. I guess a one question I would have um, with regard to the protection of the plan, Kelly, what are some things, whether in insurance related or um, estate planning related that you see as maybe some um, uh, areas of exposure for, for them? I mean, in general, the insurance looks pretty good. Like the term 
20 years. They just purchased it five years ago. So they're going to get the kids through college. I know we had talked about this the last time, what amounts make sense. You know, the disability policies, the amount looks reasonable with the 60% um, of income replaced. I would say the own occupation for two years is a little bit of a question mark. You know, sometimes we see um, the policies follow an income amount. So is it the income amount or is it that own your own or any occupation? So that's probably something I'd look at a little further because we know just with actuarial data that that can be a bigger problem than right. the event. Um, but things look reasonable. I would say I would get the estate planning documents updated. So I would get the will um double checked and updated. Some other things probably have changed as well over the last 16 years. I am a fan of having advanced medical directives in place. Like, you know, in terms of retirement, you know, I think one of the things, one of the statistics in our slide deck is that things happen sooner than we think they might happen at times. So on the positive side, if you have an opportunity to retire, great. But sometimes health events, issues, um, you know, things happen unexpectedly. So having your documents in place is important and it makes it a lot simpler and less chaotic, especially at this phase. Like the kids aren't really old enough to be making decisions. So you do still need to have things in place for sure. Yeah. I I think obviously, and that's, that's one of the, I think often overlooked, um, parts of the financial plan and, and, and unless you're like military where they kind of force you to do wills and things like that that's where you typically see it you know more frequently um but just making sure that that's buttoned up and um you know there's there's a plan in place for that i think the other thing that i would probably circle back um on and robert love to hear your thoughts on is just like the overall like allocation you know i see things like balance fund i see that we're we're funding a traditional ira which kind of see funky. We're in 2035 target date funds, which are kind of in that time frame. You know, 10 to 15 years is still a pretty long time to go. So I'd want to dig deeper into that in terms of what they're actually invested in. We know as we talked, you know, over uh at length in the past that the allocation can solve a lot of things because you know, if you're looking at 10 years, 20 years time, um, you know, typically the 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 stock market will take care of you. So how would you look at their their investments, particularly with the traditional IRA and maybe some of the allocations that you're seeing? Yeah. So one of the things on the traditional IRA that we need to double check on is, you know, how are these dollars even going in there? Um, You know, based on the fact that she has a 401k and they make so much money, she shouldn't even be qualified for deductible contributions. So we need to make sure that these contributions have been going in non-deductible, that they're not trying to take a deduction on it. Beyond yeah. that, having them in a balanced fund doesn't sound bad. Um, you know, most people in the world would believe that balanced means 50-50, but in the finance world, it means 60-40 because why would we make sense? Um, so a 60-40 fund on that account isn't terrible um, for their age range, but it's probably a little a little conservative. To go along with that, the, the target date 2035 funds, the which are just mutual funds aged for a use at 2035, so they decrease in uh, risk over time. Those are probably about the same right now. So they're both about 60, 40 at this point in time. I think that that should be probably extended. If they're going to stay in a target date fund, which is not necessarily a bad thing, I probably want to extend it closer to the 2045 timeframe um, to line up more with a, a normalized retirement. You don't actually aim for the year you're planning to retire. It's more so you aim for 65 and then that stretches out over your lifetime. It'll never go to 0% um, investments. It'll always have something in the market because if we're going to live to 100, we can't just put it all into cash the day we retire. So we need to have some risk in there. And I think they still need to have a little bit more risk going on. So we want to look at what options they have, what the fees are, what the expenses are. Uh, how complex we can make it. But at the very minimum, I'd like to maybe take that up to about 80-20 from a risk perspective. And we obviously talk to them and make sure that they're comfortable with that amount. But with their current time horizon, I think that that would still work. Yeah, I think it's asking those clar- clarifying questions and and maybe digging into, you know, because I think even all target date funds necessarily aren't created the same. There's, there's different um, allocations that are associated depending on the year. I think the other thing that I would probably want to look at just to make sure is that um, you know, they could have a balance fund for the the 529, which 
you know, might be good for, you know, Michael's accounts, but maybe not for Paul's. Maybe it is, you know, he's four, Paul's 14. So he has a couple more years, but, uh, you know, maybe just looking at that. So, you know, as Michael's going to college, we're not, you know, overexposed in equities and we see a crash and then, you know, not as much, uh, you know, dollars are there. One, one question, and, and then we can wrap this up, guys. I think one question that I would ask kind of related to the mortgage. So they're, 46 and 48 respectively and based on their refi um that happened after what was that that was in 2015 so we'll say seven years ago they have 23 years left on the mortgage um kelly you're you recently relocated so maybe get your take on this you know like did your thoughts on like you know if fiona one of her says like we have too much debt and and i think Robert did an excellent job of of outlining a path that we that basically we can redeploy some of the assets to basically wipe all the debt out except for the mortgage. My question is this: If I'm my you know mid to late forties or or fifties, and I I have a a mortgage that's going to take me well beyond retirement age, should I be freaking out about that? Or you know, it, what's what's your thought? Like, how do you talk clients off the to that part because you know you know debt obviously is it's it something that can be a detriment to your retirement paycheck in the, in the future so walk me through what you guys think in terms of that it's like man i'm i'm 46 i'm 48 we have 23 years left in mortgage you know or you know the sky is falling oh my gosh i love this question because i think it really could be all over the place so i hope <laughs> it will yeah, I feel like there could be point, counterpoint, point, counterpoint about this. So it is interesting. Like off the top of my head, when we do the nest egg, we're like, okay, well, you, the wage replacement ratio, like 70% of what you're living on now because you're debt free, you're not paying into retirement. Yeah. But it, like they've said that they want to move. So it will be interesting to see, like, if you are downsizing and you're going to sell the house anyhow, like, that current mortgage debt is not going to be as big of an issue. I would say if they're not moving, you know, ideally you'd probably like to see it paid off, but it really does come down to cash flow. So like when we run modeling and looking at retirement and potential for success to reach a very pleasant age of 95 or 100 and still have resources it really always comes down to cash flow and budget. Like what you're living on per year has a big impact on that. So, like, is the mortgage affordable to make the plan work? It really does depend. Like, it would go into modeling and scenarios. And again, comfort. Like, I guess I would lean towards wanting the debt paid off if I wasn't moving before retirement. But then we just had that conversation in my house and, you know, my spouse is like, nah, I could live with pain <laughs> for a couple of years. And then we sell it and we become expats on a Caribbean Island or we're doing. So ah, I hate, I hate the, it depends, but I, I do think like it kind of does a little bit like wherever they go with it, Robert, I will love to hear what you add into before I turn it over to Robert. I would say to the other thing about wealth protection at this stage, this is often when our parents are having stuff going on too. If their parents are yeah. still alive and they're, they have a relationship. So something, some understanding about that that relationship and expectation is definitely a key part of protection. Like I'm often surprised at what a, what an overwhelming time that can be. Like the kids are in college, but the parents have some type of health issue and that can yeah. be stressful as well. Which is, is important to bring up because not necessarily that like Fiona or Roy's parents would be our clients, but their, but their parents situation can, can affect the financial plan of our clients. So it's good to kind of get in front of that before, you know, you know, have those hard conversations about, you know, who is doing what or providing care, or if they have policies that, you know, it's not left to the one to kind of um, cover down on that. So yeah, that's a, that's a huge, important point. How about you, Robert, in terms of the debt, you know, 23 years left, I'm in my mid to late forties, you know, should I be freaking out about that? Or is it uh it depends? 
specifically for the mortgage, I think Kelly Kelly's point there that you know the two of them in her her own household have different kind of vibes on that. Yeah, that, that's one of the the key things when we're talking about this with clients is mathematically, I can tell you the right answer, right? The mathematically, it's interest rate arbitrage. We're paying four percent on the mortgage. We can get you know eight and a half percent in a 80 20 portfolio. We should just put it in the retirement accounts. But the emotional variable, I can't calculate for. So if someone has a money script that tells them that they have to have no mortgage when they retire because they saw their parents or their grandparents have issues in their life because they had a mortgage tying them down, then that's something we have to attack. If they're going to downsize, that doesn't necessarily mean that their mortgage is going to go down in Florida. Right? True. Are they going to leave a single family home in New Jersey and move to a very swanky condo, um, yeah. you know, a, 50, a 50s plus condo in Florida where they're playing shuffleboard with movie stars? Um, maybe they're going to be paying more even with less space. So those are kind of some things to work out. But having that conversation, a 4% interest rate, although it may have sounded extremely large, you know, a year and a half ago, or even six months ago is, is really a good rate historically. And it's not going to be the end of the world. It's securitized debt. So it's tied to their house. Um, I would be more worried about the other loans, right? So that- I was going to say the same thing. Like probably yeah. even this, like the student loans that have probably just yeah. been kicked, you know, kicked down the the road a bit. I would almost, and, and this is probably even an emotional thing because I'm sure the, what we said, the, the student loans are four and a quarter. So not that much more, but- you know, I I think, and this is more an emotional thing that that is a bias of mine. I'm like, let's retire those loans before we start sending Michael to to school. It would be my thought. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great it's a great point. Is you know, what is the what is the plan in the future? But it's 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 that arbitrage. Do we, you know, do we do we emotionally make that extra payment on a four percent mortgage, which historically over a thirty year mortgage reduces that by seven years if you pay that extra payment or do you put that extra payment more towards the retirement get a better you know rate of return over the long term and and secure that so i don't know that's it, that's also another thing that you know as, as kelly mentioned in her household it's different it's, it's it's different in our household too i don't think it really even registers with shay where i'm like i kind of in my mind want to have the mortgage paid off like as I retire, which in, in my mind is 70, but I could lose my marbles before that and and have to retire sooner. That, that could be a thing. So that's another thing that people sometimes discount is that you know, you're not always in control of when you actually retire, either because of career stuff or health stuff. So um yeah. So I think these are fascinating questions that you know we're we're kind of talking about this in a vacuum, but to really go back and ask Fiona, ask Roy, you know, the the fake clients that we're we're talking about. Some clarifying questions about the debt, you know, about the the investments, the education, and uh, re, you know, the retirement picture. Um, I think would be really important to you know then proceed with the plan. And again, as we always say, it's not about necessarily the plan; it's about plan in because we know the next time we talk, you know, there's going to be a wrench, you know, in 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 the system that's going to potentially you know have us zig and zag um, as we get you know further along the plan. So, guys, anything else to add? No. no, I think they're in a great spot. I think that um, Fiona and Roy have done a really good job kind of setting themselves up for success. Uh, people always like to say, and I use this phrase all the time, you know, money is power, but money is not power. Options are power. Yeah. Right? Having the option to do different things and having the ability to make different plans is powerful. So they have put themselves in a place where they have a lot of options going forward and they can choose what they believe is the best path and the best plan is the one that works. So as long as it works for them, then they made the right choice. Totally agree. Happens if they uh, use the RSUs to buy an RV, we'll see. <laughs> Don't do it. That's Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I was talking to the team last night on our on our happy hour that I had an eight hundred dollar RV maintenance bill. It's actually eleven hundred dollars. So um, yeah, they're they're a money pit. But uh, all right, uh, Robert Kelly, thanks again for uh, talking about the Andersons on our, our case study here. Looking forward to doing the next one here in the next couple months. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, do it again soon. As we conclude this week's podcast, an important reminder that the content on this show is provided to you for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in the podcast and corresponding material should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. 
We urge listeners to consult with a financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archive newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and may not be accurate at the time you listen to it on the podcast. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist unless otherwise noted and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thank you again for your support of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast. Have a great rest of your week.